Welcome everyone to the 23rd edition of the EV Journal Club. Um, thanks to everybody who has joined today. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, a really distinct pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Teresa Whiteside of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, uh, Teresa is somebody who, um, if you are just getting into the field of cancer immunology or really anything to do with the immune system, um, you could not have a better education than to read through her papers, of which there are very, very many. So um, uh, Dr. Whiteside is uh, one of those people who, when you know, folks introduce them, they say, well, this person needs no introduction. Um, but it's such, a, it's such a pleasure. It's so fun to talk about their, um, you know, their accomplishments that you, you, you end up giving them an introduction anyway. Um, so, so Dr. Whiteside is a, is a very prolific, very productive, um, very insightful scientist that I've, uh, I've had a lot of respect for. Um, for a long time. And Teresa, if I'm not mistaken, some of your very earliest work was on extracellular things. Um, uh, oh, extracellular yes. Enzymes. Um, and, and now you, you are continuing to work on, on extracellular components. Um, so over the years with cytokines um, and now with extracellular vesicles. Um, so would you mind just telling us a little bit about, about those, those early projects that you were working on? Well, um, actually, it all started when we looked at plasma of patients with cancer. And we noticed that only uh, cancer patients' plasma inhibited functions of activated T cells. And then we, that was about 15 years ago. And then we said, what is it in cancer patients' plasma that messes up T cells? And uh, little by little, we heard about these microvesicles in plasma. And so we isolated microvesicles. That's what they were called 15 years ago. Lo and behold, that's what it was. And that started us on looking at exosomes and believe, and, and excuse me, I will be calling them exosomes, not small extracellular vesicles because I'm used to exosomes. So, and it turned out to be exosomes and that started our whole uh, line of investigation of how um, exosomes that are derived particularly from tumor cells inhibit, interfere with the host immune system. And this has sort of remained our main topic of, of work and investigations in the last few years. Well, that's, um, that's excellent. And, and, you know, we're really looking forward to hearing about one particular aspect of what you've been working on. And this is a paper that was just recently published in the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles. Um, so, Dr. Whiteside, thanks again, and welcome to the EV Journal Club. And I'll um, hand the, the screen share over to you um, for your presentation. So, um, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Teresa Whiteside, and uh, it is my pleasure to um, entertain you with a little vignette, if you wish, about uh, exosomes in acute myelogenous leukemia and how they may contribute to chemo resistance and how it all has to do with intracellular cholesterol uh, metabolism. So we've been working uh, with AML, um, exosomes in AML for many years, actually. We know a lot about uh, these exosomes. So you all know, this audience know, knows that um, extracellular vesicles um, or exosomes do a lot of different things. Uh, what is not listed here is, um, is, um, in, is in the, the fact that exosomes also induce chemoresistance. Next, Ken. And they do, uh, in next, Ken. Uh, we know that in patients with AML who are treated with chemotherapy, that's the standard of care therapy for patients with AML, that these patients don't uh, respond often. Uh, in fact, they don't respond and, and recur because uh, the blasts develop resistance uh, to chemotherapy. And there are various mechanisms uh, for resistance, uh, but few people actually thought that it has to do with extracellular vesicles. Well, we've known for a long time that there are elevated levels of exosomes in plasma of patients um, uh, 
could we go back? I don't know why it skipped. Could we go back one slide? Next, please. Okay, so in plasma of AML patients, there are elevated uh, levels of extracellular vesicles as compared to normal controls plasma. And these exosomes uh, or, or vesicles carry leukemia-associated antigen listed there uh, with blue, and also, importantly, carry a lot of immunoinhibitory uh, proteins, such as transforming growth factor beta, PDL1, TRAIL, and many others. Next. Uh, it's, it, interestingly, this high vesicle level occurs not only at the time of diagnosis, but when these patients receive induction chemotherapy, uh, and then uh, again, consolidation therapy in the course of their treatments, high levels of, of these extracellular vesicles uh, are up and they remain as high as they were at the time of diagnosis of, or higher. And initially we thought that it may have to do with the, with the relapse of these patients. If the levels stay high, then they, have a, they will relapse sooner. And uh, we still are looking at this at the present time. Um, uh, and, and we do, as you see at the bottom of the slide, we do the um, serial monitoring, uh, taking plasma from these patients at various stages during therapy, pre, during, and post. And, um, and um, next slide. Uh, so there used to be a, a story, and this, you know, I prepared this slide almost oh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, uh, trying to explain how exosome might be involved with resistance to chemotherapy. So you see that all cells uh, release exosomes. And in cells that are sensitive uh, to chemotherapy, in this case is flat, uh, these cells die. And therefore, they no longer uh, release exosomes. And so low exosomal Le protein level in plasma. On the other hand, if the cells are resistant, they package the chemotherapeutic drug into exosome, export it out, and there is a high exosome level in uh, plasma of patients. So that kind of concept, um, you know, we thought, oh, so maybe indeed the high level of of um, exosome in plasma of patients with AML post chemotherapy uh, has something to do with resistance uh, of the cells to chemotherapy. Next slide. So we try to put together the idea of, uh, of this um, uh, lots of extracellular vesicles and resistance to chemotherapy and cholesterol um, came into the equation because there has been some evidence in the literature that AML blasts have high cholesterol levels, and there's been some murmuring in the literature that this high cholesterol level indeed may have something to do with chemoresistance. So first, we know about um, we don't know very much actually. We know a lot and yet not a lot about how uh, extracellular vesicles are packaged. The mechanism of, of their uh, production and packaging, there's still a lot to be done. Uh, but in addition to various protein uh, networks, uh, we know that lipids are involved in secretion of, uh, of exosomes. So um, in chemotherapy, uh, as well as irradiation, uh, increases uh, not only uh, vesicle release, but also cholesterol levels in AML blast. This has been uh, reported in the literature, and I'll show this um, in, a, in a minute in our system. Therefore, it is possible that an excess of the, um, of the vesicles that we observe in plasma after chemotherapy is related to cholesterol accumulation in AML blast. 
Now, synthesis of, uh, of cholesterol is a complex process, but there is an enzyme called 3-hydroxymethylglutaryl coenzyme A reductase. Terrible name, very long name. So uh, we call it HMGCR enzyme, and that's a key enzyme that regulates cholesterol uh, synthesis. Next slide, Ken. And here is a, a simplified diagram of the cholesterol synthesis pathway, which shows uh, this enzyme, HMGCR, blocking mavalonic acid and in turn blocking, um, uh, which leads to cholesterol production. And HMGCR blocks this pathway. In turn, HMGCR is blocked by statins. Uh, it's been long known that simvastatin, in fact, is an excellent blocker of HMGCR and therefore reduces cholesterol levels. Some of us are taking uh, simvastatin. So we, um, we thought, okay, so this, this cholesterol pathway has something to do uh, with uh, release of uh, exosomes and uh, let's look at it more closely. And we begin by looking in vitro by using um, AML cell lines. So a Kasumi is one, Kasumi one is such a uh, extracellular, uh, is such a cell line. And we used it initially in our experiments. And all of the experiments that I will be presenting have been done by Chang Suk Hong, uh, who's been a collaborator and we've been working together for oh, almost 10 years. And she has been particularly interested in these exosomes in AML. Uh, she's with us, I believe, on this, um, in this, on this conference. And Chang Suk, say something if, if I stray in a wrong way. Next slide, Kim. So before we start, I want to tell you how we isolate our exosomes from supernatant of, of, of cell lines or from supernatants uh, of, 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 uh, or from uh, plasma of patients with cancer. So we use size exclusion chromatography. We call it mini size exclusion chromatography because our column is about 10 centimeters long. And we always put one ml of plasma, which had been previously uh, differentially centrifuged and ultra filtered to remove larger vesicles and, um, and to clear it, pre clear it. And one ml of uh, this pre cleared plasma or supernatant uh, goes on the column, and we collect one ml fraction. Most of our exosomes come in fraction number four, indicated there with uh, arrow. You can see that these are non-aggregated. They have beautiful vesicular morphology, whereas in fraction number five, already there are not only a few of them there, but they tend to aggregate. And we immunologists are particularly interested in working with non-aggregated exosomes because we want to manipulate them using antibodies. So we want them non-aggregate them. We want beautiful uh, mor uh, vesicular morphology. And we can, of course, and this, uh, this, these uh, photographs are taken from, uh, have been published in a paper in Journal Extracellular Vesicles in 2016, where we describe how we isolate these exosomes. Next slide shows us um, the exosome isolated from, uh, uh, from plasma uh, of patients with AML. Uh, and uh, on the left, you can see again from how, what they look like, nice, nice vesicular morphology, Western blotting to show that they, in addition to this leukemia associated antigens, they are AML exosomes, in addition to CD81, CD9, uh, and Alex, which are endocytic, with Alex and endocytic marker, uh, TSG101, one endocytic marker, and absence of uh, proteins that are usually in lysates, but not in exosome GRP94 or connexin. And on the right, you can see uh, vesicles isolated from plasma of patients treated 
with, uh, during induction chemotherapy. It's about a 14 day in induction chemotherapy treatment. And you can see a diagnosis lower, lower levels of, um, of exosomes. Uh, they increase in most patients, not in all. In some, they decrease, but in the majority of patients, they go up and a mean level is certainly higher on day 10 during this indu induction chemotherapy. Next slide. Uh, we actually are interested not only looking at the protein level, but also at the numbers of vesicles. So I determined by Q-nano or nanocyte. And so um, we, uh, we actually, uh, Chang Su prepared this ni nice graph showing how nicely the protein level of our fraction four um, exosomes correlate with the numbers uh, of exosomes that we see uh, in QNano or in nanocyte. Next slide. So the first experiment, uh, we wanted to treat uh, the, um, uh, the uh, co-incubate, the Kasumi AML cells with uh, the, the chemotherapeutic drug RSC, uh, so uh, citarabine, or a simvastatin or cholesterol. But before we started this experiment, we had to determine the optimal doses of these uh, uh, compounds uh, because RSC, for example, at high concentration would kill the cells. So we don't want that. And so we did a uh, uh, titration experiment to determine the optimal dose of RSC that did not kill the cells. And you can see that this was 0.2 to 0.4 micromolars of RSC in, under A. Uh, in, in, and we did the same thing um, uh, for uh, simvastatin and, um, and, ex and cholesterol. Uh, this is uh, extra, extracellular cholesterol. And you can see uh, that we determined the optimal doses at this doses um, the cell viability was just fine. The cells were not dying. And so now we look at uh, how many uh, um, extracellular vesicles, small extracellular vesicles uh, were being produced in the presence of RSC alone or, or in presence of simvastatin. You see simvastatin inhibited very significantly the level of uh, exosomal protein in the supernatant of Kasumi. So did uh, actually e extracellular cholesterol. It also inhibited significantly. And when you combine uh, RSC and simvastatin, uh, again, uh, simvastatin uh, did uh, inhibit um, effects of, 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 of RSC. So changes in, in, in SAV production uh, by Kasumi one cells um, uh, uh, are clearly influenced by the presence of RSC, uh, simvastatin, and extracellular cholesterol. Next slide. So we not only wanted to you look at the protein levels, but at the counts of uh, total uh, extracellular vesicles that are being uh, uh, released. Uh, upon co-incubation with RSC, for example, here, the incubation is of the cells uh, with RSC is for 24 hours. And you can see that not only the number of, um, of particles is increased in supernatant after RSC treatment, uh, but their um, particle numbers uh, is increased. And however, the size of, of vesicles or particles remains the same, uh, about um, uh, you know, uh, 100 uh, or 110, between 110 and 120 nm in the size of these vesicles. Next. Uh, we also um, um, showed that the increases in the release of exosomes from Kasumi cell lines after RSC treatment actually were dose dependent. And we measured it here by on-beat flow cytometry 
uh, looking at, um, so we, we, we isolated the, the, the exosome from cell supinatants of Kasumi, um, and they were captured on streptavidin microbeats, which were coated with biotinylated anti-CD9 antibodies, captured exosome there, and developed them with APC conjugated antibodies specific for CD81. And you can see that as the RRC level increased, there were more vesicles that were positive for CD81 uh, in point two in higher level of, uh, at higher level of RRC than lower level of RRC. So uh, these, um, this, this release of, of exosome from cells treated with RSC were dose dependent. Next. So uh, now we look at the cholesterol level in the Kasumi cells that are treated with RSC and release these, these exosomes. So there is a, there is a compound, a, a, a protein called philippin, which you, you, you buy it, it's labeled, and it binds specifically to cholesterol. And so we treated um, the cells with, uh, with this philippin, and you can see that after post rsc treatment, in red there is an increase in, in cholesterol in the cell. We also have an assay. Uh, Chang Suk measured cholesterol at level by commercially available assay in the supernatant on Kasumi, and again, Following RSC treatment here on the B, you can see an, uh, that there is an increased cholesterol levels in, 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 these, in these cells. Uh, in C, you have Western blots. Here we show that this um, uh, enzyme, uh, HMGCR, which is the key enzyme in, in cholesterol synthesis, is clearly increased. Uh, even in what you can see it very nicely in Western blood, but so is the uh, concentration of um, a, a protein um, SREBP2. That's a sterile regulating element binding protein 2, which is actually a transcription factor that regulates uh, this enzyme, a uh, synthesis of this enzyme HMGCR2. That, uh, that uh, transcription factor is also increased following RSC. And in addition, a receptor for low density lipoprotein um, uh, is also increased. So, so this complex of proteins are all involved in cholesterol metabolism. And the fault change uh, in, 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 in HMGCR or SREBP or, LD, or, or, or LDLR are all, you can see there, they are all increased um, uh, in following co-incubation of cells with, um, uh, and this is an increase that you see on exosomes of the cells. Uh, furthermore, if we look at message expression for the enzymes, for the HMGCR here in outline in red, you can see that um, uh, mRNA expression uh, is, uh, is also uh, high. Next. So uh, the, we then thought, well, okay, so clearly the uh, activity of this enzyme appears to be uh, critical for cholesterol um, uh, synthesis accumulation uh, in the cells. Uh, the exosomes are rich in this enzyme. Uh, what would happen uh, if we blocked HMC uh, G GCR activity? Uh, and so we wanted to uh, transfect the tumor cells um, and in this experiment, Chang Suk did not use AML, Kasumi cell line, uh, because it's not adherent and it's been, it's a sort of a pain in the neck to do transfection with non-adherent cells. So she transfected siRNA uh, to um, another tumor cell, adherent tumor cell, uh, PCI13. It's a head and neck cancer cell line, which we use all the time. And, uh, and, and here uh, we're showing you that um, HM, uh, uh, 
uh, GCR-SIRNA indeed inhibited uh, the enzyme expression in, in, in the cells. Uh, control SIRNA did not. And then the, uh, the um, secretion of extracellular vesicles uh, that, are, um, uh, that are carrying, um, uh, that have the, uh, uh, from SIRNA uh, exposed uh, cells uh, is very low uh, in comparison to controls. So blocking of this activity uh, reduced uh, production of extracellular vesicles um, uh, in tumor cells. Next. So now, so this was experiment, ex, uh, in vitro experiment with Kasumi cell line. Uh, and now uh, we wanted to know whether uh, vesicles isolated from plasma of AML patients that are treated either with um, ARAC or the cytabin, another related uh, chemotherapeutic that is commonly used in, in, um, in AML, whether these SEV are also, uh, uh, also carry this enzyme, this critical enzyme HMGCR. And uh, under A, you see that yes, following treatment with ARAC, uh, the exosome from plasma of the patients with AML uh, uh, indeed are enriched in HMGCR. Uh, and um, then um, the important uh, thing here is that remember that these are exosomes that we isolate in fraction four of the column that we use for their isolation, okay? And uh, that fraction four does not contain any ApoB, which is involved in uh, low density lipoprotein, uh, whereas the fraction next to it was already rich in, in, uh, in ApoB. But it was important for us to show that there was no ApoB in, uh, in fraction four that we use for all of our experiment. We do not collect fraction five. So uh, this exosomal fraction was enriched each NMGCR, but uh, there was no ApoB present, no low density lipoproteins there. So, uh, so then we, we ask what about um, uh, uh, how many um, ves extracellular vesicles in, in, in different patients uh, and D is a diagnosis, and C is after chemotherapy. And just like in in vitro system, in these exosome from patients treated with chemotherapy, you see increases uh, in, 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 in um, uh, this enzyme, HMGCR, and this is accompanied by increase in um, uh, production of um, SEV, as per protein levels, and a fault change is indicated in the right, and you can see that indeed it is a significant increase in patients um, uh, following um, chemotherapy. Next. So, um, so um, that's, that's about the metabolism uh, in, 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 in cells and, um, and the presence of the enzyme in the in the vesicles. Now, you know that these exosomes also have autocrine effects, particularly in the tumor microenvironment. Of course, they are everywhere, but they also interact, the, the, the vesicles that are produced by tumor cells um, also have tremendous autocrine effects. And this is what I want to show you, what we want to show you here. So we labeled uh, Kasumi cell produced exosome. We labeled them with uh, PKH dye, PKH26, or on the right there with CFSE. And we're showing you that indeed um, these uh, labeled um, extracellular vesicles are taken up by uh, Kasumi cells when we co incubate them with these exosomes. And this is, of course, flow cytometry. And this flow cytometry is done um, with following acid wash. Why? 
because uh, often um, acid wash removes the surface. The vesicles may stick on the surface or they may go inside the cells and we are interested in the ones that go inside the cells. So the acid wash removes the vesicles sticking to the surface of Kasumi cells and you can see uh, here that the vesicles are nicely in perinuclear uh, location. And uh, then um, in the cell lysate uh, of these Kasumi treated with, um, uh, with aut autologous uh, EVs, if you wish, exosomes, you can see that there is a, I apologize, that there is an in the presence of or increased um, HMGCR um, uh, concentration of enzyme, and that this also is concentration dependent, depending on how many exosomes uh, we feed to Kasumi uh, cells. Next slide. So indeed, uh, uptake of labeled vesicles by Kasumi cell line. Uh, you can see the fillet with Philippine, remember that protein that, uh, that binds specifically to, um, to cholesterol, suggests by flow cytometry here that there is some increase in cholesterol. And then uh, when we look at the uh, um, mean fluorescence intensity uh, in several ex three experiments, you can see indeed that uh, there is an, an, an increase in cholesterol uh, following um, uh, these vesicles that, um, uh, that came from cells treated with RSC. At the bottom, bottom you can see that um, the, uh, this SEV produced by Kasumi, treated with RSC, um, induced uh, cholesterol uh, synthesis in uh, Kasumi co-incubated with, so it's sort of, you know, Kasumi produces uh, the exosome, we take these exosomes, we introduce them to uh, um, uh, uh, untreated Kasumi cell, and you can see that there is increased cholesterol uh, production. Uh, what is also increased is actually not survival of, tu of tumor cell, Kasumi cells. Um, we measured actually proliferation, but in other experiments, we know that not only proliferation, but survival of tumor cells uh, treated with these vesicles is also increased. So, so the vesicles um, uh, from uh, Kasumi uh, treated with RSC, these vesicles uh, induce cholesterol production, induce proliferation and survival of um, Kasumi, uh, untreated Kasumi uh, cells, if you wish. Uh, next slide is probably just, um, uh, it, it, yeah, this is from now going back to patients again that chemotherapy enhances EV production and content of cholesterol and HMGCR, this time not in, uh, not in leukemic cells or leukemic blasts, if you wish, in, in, in patients, but in peripheral blood mononuclear cells obtained from healthy donors. So we took PBMC from healthy donor, lo and behold, uh, these, uh, the, the exosomes, these, um, uh, this, this, no, the, 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 the exosomes there, the, the cells have HMGCR and, uh, and increased production, increased expression of HMGCR uh, following RSC or DC treatment there in A. And also you can see that uh, these cells, PBMCs, also have high, higher uh, cholesterol levels uh, on per number of cells uh, following RSC or the cytobine treatment. Uh, similarly, uh, the um, production, if you wish, of SEVs uh, per uh, 10 to the uh, per, per given number of cells is also increased. So it's in, as is the expression 
of the enzyme, the cholesterol uh, synthesizing uh, enzyme. So essentially, the normal donors, PBMC, uh, behave exactly the same way as the tumor cell in response to, um, to the um, uh, exosomes uh, that, um, that, are, um, that they are incubated with. Okay, so that I think uh, brings me to a summary and to trying to put together this series of in vitro ex vivo experiment and how we interpret it. Next slide. So uh, we know uh, that um, uh, exosomes are produced by all cells. They are freely circulating uh, and they are in all body fluids. In cancer, the, uh, these exosomes are produced by tumor cells, but also by non-malignant cells. Plasma of any cancer patients is a mixture of uh, exosomes from the tumor and from non-malignant cells. Chemo resistance that is induced by these SEVs uh, does not seem to be limited to exosomes produced by tumor cells because uh, you can see the same effects in plasma in, in PBMC of patients of, of normal donors. In AML, post-chemotherapy, the cells synthesize and release cholesterol. They increase this, uh, uh, this activity of this enzyme, cholesterol synthesizing enzyme, HMGCR. Uh, there is increased uh, exosome production and via autocrine mechanism, uh, these vesicles set up a vicious cycle. More cholesterol, greater tumor cell proliferation, better survival on tumor cells, and of course, resistance to chemotherapy. So in cancer, and that's not only in AML, there is some evidence that the same phenomena uh, occur in, um, in, um, in other cancer. Tumor, ser serve deri tumor cell derived exosomes uh, carry, and we know uh, from, from many years we've looked at these um, tumor derived exosomes, we know they carry an excess of immunosuppressive proteins which block functions of immune cells uh, and thus promote tumor cell survival and resistance to therapy. So not only do we have this autocrine effects that I described to you of exosomes uh, being released uh, from chemotherapy treated uh, cells, uh, but we also have the fact that these uh, tumor derived vesicles are immunosuppressive. They affect the immune system. So the resistant, resistance to chemotherapy is probably due to at least these two mechanisms. On the one hand, the autocrine effects of exosomes released by a blast after chemotherapy or by normal cells um, that, were, that were affected by chemotherapy but also it may be due to a certain extent to this immunosuppressive effects of tumor derived exosomes. Now, the interesting thing is, and the important thing in this little story is that um, uh, the statin, simvastatin, in combination with uh, standard of care chemotherapy actually reduces cholesterol levels. And in fact, they are already are some clinical, uh, we know of at least one clinical trial where uh, chemotherapy is combined with simvastatin or equivalent of simvastatin. And, and, and this, in, it presumably blocks this vicious cycle that is perpetuated by exosomes and thus improves uh, efficacy of chemotherapy. So, so, this, um, so this whole little story um, gives us hope that perhaps by means of 
regulating cholesterol levels in um, or or um, that is present in this SEV uh, that are produced both in health and in disease, uh, one could really uh, reduce um, uh, chemo resistance. So I'm going to stop here. And just to say that, uh, again, that all the experiments that I described to you were performed by Chang, um, Chang Suk Hong, who is with us here. And also uh, credit goes to my colleague, Dr. Boyazis, uh, who is a hematologist and who uh, works with us, has worked with us for many years, looking at exosomes in patients with AML. So thank you much, and I'll be glad to answer questions. Well, thank you, Teresa. That was um, a, a very nice presentation, very clearly delivered, and I think um, has, has led to some interesting questions um, that have already been posed in the chat box. Um, so I am gonna go ahead here and allow people to unmute themselves, and we'll probably just go through the, the list here of, of, of the questions that have been asked. Um, starting with one that I think is, is from Tom, and so to some extent this was, this was um, addressed, but perhaps you um, want to follow up yes. on, on, on this, Tom, <coughs> the depot B. Uh, you're, you're quite right, I jumped the gun on this question, and a lot of it was addressed, but I'd like to ask a similar question if I could, um, which is, to what extent did you look for um, contaminating soluble proteins in your EV sample? And do you think there could have been some kind of effect from them? Well, um, we did, we, in this particular study, we really did not look at contaminating protein. And that all depends what you call contaminating proteins. We think that our, the exosomes that we uh, make, that we isolate from plasma or from supernatants are actually reasonably uh, pure. Uh, you know, clearly there are plas some plasma proteins that are sitting in there, but quite uniformly, well, we know there is albumin and there's immunoglobulins there, and there clearly may be other, there may be cytokines sitting in there. Uh, that is quite possible uh, that, uh, that uh, there are, but as it was, and you know, we have a whole other story, uh, uh, story uh, just sent for publication looking for analysis of these exosomes, um, not in AML, but in melanoma or in head and neck cancer by, uh, by um, proteomics, proteomics analysis. So we pretty much know what these exosomes carry and what and there's a variety, of course, of different proteins there. So anywhere from 400 to 500 different proteins. Take your pick. No, okay, thank you. Um, I, yeah, I was just curious about um, soluble proteins that might have co-isolated that aren't genuinely the associated. You know, uh, the only thing we know is that in patients with AML, serum protein level, for example, of cholesterol is very low. And it is very low because people think because cholesterol is, need, is taken up by, by malignant cells. And they, they really need it in order to proliferate and, and grow. And so that's why, at least that's the, that's the um, hypothesis. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question, Tom. And I think you know, your original question about the lipoprotein particles, um, I, I found it quite interesting, Teresa, that you that you observed that you know there were there was a fraction of the SEC uh, eluate that did not contain those ApoB proteins. Um, so it it, it may, I mean I think this might be useful to folks who are having problems with uh, you know separating EVs from LPPs and so on. Um, that maybe it's a matter of of, uh, of of doing finer fractionation, um, you know, and uh, and and I think yeah. the importance of of measuring those those markers is 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 uh, should be very clear from your work too. Well, so. you know, to me, it's a sort of actually quite remarkable that this fraction four that we you know we haven't done, and if the, this was of course an issue, is there L, are there you know low density high density lipoproteins there or not? 
that fraction apparently appears to be quite reasonable in comparison to the fraction next to you, as I tried to show you just by Western blocks. Indeed, indeed. All right, our next question, uh, May Mahoney, a uh, very interesting question on lipid rafts. Hi, do you, do you want me to ask or do you want yeah, to Yeah, go ask? for it. Yeah, oh, go please. and ask. Whether I'll be able to <laughs> answer, I don't know. First and foremost, I want to say thank you so much for such a beautiful talk. And second, hail to Pitt. And um, the <laughs> other thing is, I, I'm, I'm very much interested in lipid rafts. And we have noticed that RAF proteins like caviolins and uh, flotillins are yes. in and out of these lipid rafts depending upon what we do to membrane surface proteins that would right. then modulate EV biogenesis. So I was just wondering, have you looked at any of these RAF associated proteins? Uh, no, we, we don't. They all, you know, we sort of use flotillin as a, as a marker of of, of uh, you know, exosomes uh, in some cases. And that's about, uh, about all. We actually have not worked with, uh, with lipid uh, rafts. You know, uh, this whole project with exosomes from uh, AML uh, with cholesterol um, and, and lipids is sort of evolved as a sideline of, of, of our major interest we are more interested in how these exosomes influence recurrence of the disease and minimal residual disease by uh, rather than, um, than looking at uh, mechanistic issues of, of lipid rafts. But I'm sure that there is a connection. We've a sort of scratched the connection, uh, but so much of our studies, I think, of how these uh, extracellular vesicles, exosomes particularly, are produced in, 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 in the endocytic compartment. Uh, I think we know a lot, but we really don't know a lot. And they are very complex, I think, interactions, protein, uh, protein interactions, and protein lipid interaction. Thank you. Thanks for the question. So I think we have a few questions now that are related to uh, the patients and also what is possible in patient populations here, what, what this work implies for, um, for treatment. So to start with, uh, Stephen Amoa, um, go ahead with your question, please. Yeah, thank you very much for this exciting talk. I think my question has largely been answered in your final bullet, but I'm just wondering, I mean, apart from the Simba starting, are there kind of any other medications trying to enhance the production of the SEVs? Uh, yes, uh, enhancing the production of SEV. There are several different uh, uh, ways of doing it. Uh, in fact, I think we describe uh, uh, one uh, pathway, um, I'm just trying to think, uh, that has to do with metabolism. One of the, the, the Dealing with metabolic pathways in cells uh, very often enhances the production of, of, of exosomes. Um, of exosomes. Um, and, and there are several different that have been described in the literature. In the, literature. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing about simvastatin is that it's a very common drug and a, a drug that many of us take to reduce cholesterol. And, in it, in, and it is sort of this whole connection between cholesterol and AML. Yeah, it was there, but it was not really very clear. What, what is the connection? How come that the, uh, you know, reducing cholesterol uh, might in fact uh, be operating through, uh, through exosome uh, levels and how to in, in combination of chemotherapeutic drugs, which induced uh, the release of exosomes, and yet depleting these this exosomes of, of uh, but with simvastatin of this, uh, of the, um, of this enzyme, uh, cholesterol driving enzyme, may be therapeutic. So that whole pathway, to answer you more specifically, 
one can regulate once or one can regulate both the production of exosomes, which is not easy and it may be dangerous too, because on the one hand, you know, yeah, we want to uh, decrease the production, but remember, um, the, the exosomes are not just bad guys, the exosomes are also good guys. And so what you do by regulating production or, or blocking production of exosome may really not be too great. Or you can then, manip once produced, you can try and sort of alter uh, what these vesicles carry and either remove them if they are bad or, uh, or, or decrease their, their delivery, if you wish, of this, of this enzyme that induces cholesterol synthesis. So two ways of, of doing therapy. Very good. I prefer um, the one on the right, the one when I, I would like to take away the bad exosomes <laughs> rather than, than mess up with the production of exosomes because we just don't know enough to be able to do it rationally. The, uh, the next question, question from Jack Way. Jack, was your, um, has your question been answered now or do you have a follow-up? Um, I, I think I'm trying to figure out whether uh, you have major um, or any uh, patient that you uh, encounter that uh, it's taken, you know, they are taking a statin at all. I mean, I, because it's like statin has been widely used. I'm wondering whether there's any patients already on that. Uh, I, I, I don't think that people who treat uh, patients with AML with chemotherapy have ever thought, well, no, some of them might have thought of simvastatin, but I don't think it's a widely uh, known or widely approved concept. As I said, we are aware of one clinical trial, I believe, where the combination of the two is being considered. But in general, it's a sort of a new, new idea that, uh, that uh, you know, the, the using simvastatin uh, together in combination with chemotherapy may have beneficial effects. So is that because the patient population uh, is quite different? Uh, they, they are younger also? That, because I know that, uh, you know, in, in the older generation, usually a lot well, of Well, you know, most, it, 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 I mean, AML is one of these diseases where um, they are both groups. I think the group of older individual is larger. Older individuals are, uh, have different um, uh, clinical um, symptoms and, 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 and sometimes older individuals are more difficult to treat and difficult in responding to therapy. And then there is also a pediatric population so, so um, I, I don't think that it's known. We don't know. Okay, thanks. Um, next is Krishna with some questions, some more questions about the patient population. Krishna? Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. So uh, it's really interesting. So I have a couple of questions like uh, uh, since you, so what is the status of like cholesterol like where, when you're started uh, during a diagnosis and after like the relapse or uh, during the treatment? And uh, the, as I noted correctly, so you have spe uh, specified in, in your first uh, slide or somewhere, like you use the cells where these uh, cells are not susceptible. Uh, I mean, uh, the drug dose is not killing the cells. But uh, have you considered using the, uh, the like resistant cells, real resistant cells that uh, develop during using a drug pressure mechanism? Because that's what I see uh, you have not used, I guess. Uh, uh, no, no, we have not. One would re, one would have to select the resistant cell, have a re, have a resistant cell line, and I suspect that in AML they may actually they may exist. Somebody might have the resistant um, chemo, chemo, cells resistant to chemotherapy, and look at the, certainly the same experiments that we've done with our Kasumi can be done with the resistant cell line. And, and we, can, we can extend this, and I wouldn't be surprised if Chang Suk was not already doing this, this experiment. And that, I think, is a, it's a good idea. And you know, remember that we've just scratched the surface with this whole connection between cholesterol and, and extracellular vesicles and the, and the leukemia resistance. 
I think there is more to be said. To my, to my mind, we still are very much on the surface of this whole complicated mechanism. And as you know, there are many players involved. And then we've just introduced uh, the exosomes in the mix of other factors that, uh, yeah. that clearly are involved in, in resistance. So there is a lot more to be done. But, uh, and one more like a uh, question, like uh, when you say like the protein fractions are increasing uh, in all your talk, so have you also looked into the non-EV, non-SV protein fractions because you say protein content of the EV, so, uh, so have you looked into the, any other like interesting proteins uh, coming up along with this non-EV? Um, non have we have we looked at the uh, at the exosomes to see what other proteins are are there? Is that what you're yeah. asking me? Yeah, yeah. Since you said like protein content is also increased, so whether it have you, like is any mass data like increase like any well, for example, for well, I try to tell you that we looked at uh, leukemia associated antigens, for example, and we looked at immunosuppressive proteins that are present. And those clearly, these exosomes, if they come from leukemic blasts, these uh, proteins would be highly increased as well. So again, pointing out not just one mechanism, but probably many different mechanisms involved in this chemoresistance. Thank you. All right. Well, we are coming towards the end of our of our hour now, um, and so I, I'm going to have to apologize to uh, to those of you who have asked some questions here um, in the chat box that we weren't able to get to. Um, but I I would I, if if you don't mind, I'd just like to ask one final question of you, Teresa, and that is um, I remember in in the early um, early slides that you showed with the size exclusion chromatography that you said that you didn't want to look at those EVs that had aggregated. What do you think <laughs> the role of those EVs um, might be and, 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 and why are they aggregating? Well, uh, you know, I, I, th I think that, um, of course, as we all know, that these exosomes have tendency to aggregate. There are a lot of glycoproteins there and, and, and a lot of other, um, as I said, four, 400, 500 different, different proteins. The reason that uh, I don't like to deal with aggregate, and, and let me tell you that fraction four contains the majority, we think, of these small um, extracellular vesicles. Few that hang behind are smaller, presumably. Fraction five has smaller, and they aggregate. And the reason I don't like to involve those is that if I want to use immune selection for separating the subset of these vesicles, then it doesn't work well with aggregates. And, uh, and you know, I'm an immunologist, and at the moment, what we're doing right now is actually looking at subsets of extracellular vesicles by using uh, selection with specific antibodies. And for that kind of experiment, I want beautiful non-aggregated exosomes. Very good. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So, well, um, so Derek, Augustine, and Michael, what I will do is I will I will forward your questions to Teresa, and and perhaps you can continue that conversation um, offline. But uh, but Teresa, uh, I just wanted to uh, to extend my thanks and the thanks of everybody who's been on this uh, journal club today for taking your time to uh, to come and and tell us about your work and educate us about. Um, about how these different, uh, these different pieces fit together um, in the response to chemotherapy in these AML patients. Um, so, um, so, so thank you again, Teresa, and thank everybody for joining today. Um, and we look forward to uh, seeing you all again very soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much.